Welcome to uh, our talk, Hex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, a behind the scenes look at FDA.gov's migration to Drupal 8. Um, a disclaimer before we begin, um, any opinions expressed here are those of us, or the presenters, and do not necessarily reflect uh, the positions of the Food and Drug Administration. I'm Nick Satachianen. This is Michael Jovell. <coughs> Uh, we're members of FDA's web and digital media team, uh, sorry, web and digital services team. We recently reorged, um, so <laughs> media got split off, we're now services, um, in the Office of External Affairs. Uh, it's early for us, maybe some of you. Uh, it's 9 a.m., I hope you're all caffeinated, but thank you for uh, choosing to be with, uh, with us here today. Um, today we wanted to go over four major challenges we faced in migrating FDA.gov to Drupal in terms of design and UX and talk about how we drop kicked three of those challenges in the face. Um, we wanted to show you how the sausage was made, but FDA doesn't regulate sausages. Um, USDA does. Uh, so hopefully you, you've come here for the presentation, but stay for the dad jokes. There'll be more um, as we go on. Now, M Michael and I don't have all the answers. Uh, we don't claim to. We're sometimes clueless. Um, what worked for us uh, may not work for you uh, in your situations or scenarios, but hopefully uh, what we tell you today, our story, uh, might provide some inspiration um, for you to find your own solutions to the challenges that you face. So an overview. Uh, how many folks here in the room are familiar with FDA? All right, almost all of you. Uh, all four of you. That's for the recording, folks. There's more than four people. Um, <clears throat> the, the Food and Drug Administration is uh, responsible for protecting the public health uh, by ensuring the safety, efficacy, and security of uh, human and veterinary drugs, biological products, medical devices, um, and also by ensuring the safety of our nation's food supply, uh, cosmetics, and products that emit radiation. Uh, FDA also has a responsibility for regulating uh, the manufacturing, marketing, and distribution of tobacco products to protect the public health and to reduce tobacco use by minors. Um, so we do a lot. Um, and generally, each product area, uh, whether it's food, drugs, medical devices, etc., uh, is overseen by a center, uh, like uh, the Center for Food and Safety and Nutrition, and there are nine centers in FDA. Uh, for our site, FDA.gov is the agency's primary communications channel. Um, over five million visitors uh, in a typical month, um, two-thirds of our traffic comes from web searches. Uh, over half of our visitors visit using a mobile device, um, but not many people start with a home page. Um, not many people at all. And almost everyone just finds the page they're looking for and leaves. Like, they're very direct. They know um, through based on what we know from our Google search and the patterns and our analytics, they're pretty much there, but when they're not there, when they don't find what they're looking for, they're very, very unhappy. Um, <laughs> and that's when things get crazy. So our project, our migration project lasted five uh, long years. Due to its incredible complexity and potential impact to the public and private uh, sectors, um, we launched our new site earlier this year, uh, thanks to the hard work and dedication of dozens of web con uh, contributors and content owners across FDA. Uh, a few of them, I think, are in the audience. It's hard to see with so many people out there. Um, there's a, we, we also have a, a great dev team that met almost every uh, obstacle with good humor, uh, though they may have cried and screamed privately. Um, and we have also great IT partners. So uh, I'd like to start off with our first challenge. Challenge number one involved uh, organizational silos, which uh, I'm sure uh, you're all familiar with. Um, and this is the one we didn't really get to drop kick in the face. Um, so product ownership of FDA.gov is shared between two main groups at FDA, uh, the team that Michael and I belong to, um, Web and Digital Services, and our collaborators in the Office of Information Management and Technologies, Internet, Internet branch. Um, we work well together and have a great relationship uh, we say that sincerely, and, and not because there may be members of IIB in the audience. Um, but despite our great partnership with IIB, 
our organizational silos did present impediments, uh, which we continue to push through together to this day, um, especially in the very early stages of the project. Getting on the same page, you know, even if you're an email or a Skype chat away, it's really hard to sometimes and communicate and just get a consensus about things that are crucial to the, to the success of the project, like DevOps and tooling. Is everyone has their local environment set up the right way? Is everyone using the same workflows? Is your code consistent? Um, is someone reviewing your code? Uh, and just documenting everything. Um, in the beginning of the R project, it was pretty much a wild, wild west. And it was because everyone was new. Our dev team was, was uh, new to FDA. They were experienced developers, but they weren't familiar with our content, our, our you know, content owners, stakeholders, nothing. So it, it was, um, it was, it took a while to bring them up to speed, but now they're, they're fully there, so, which is awesome. Um, to complicate things, we also have the nine centers that I mentioned before. Um, each has their own web team uh, um, and uh, with their own uh, chains of command and budgets and priorities um, and uh, business needs and, and each team uh, participates in FDA's Web Governance Council, which is co-chaired by uh, our team and also IIB. So when you include the centers, we have other challenges uh, with organizational silos. We have separate and conflicting business needs, which we often had to reconcile. Um, and sometimes they were at odds with each other. Like one center would have a business need for this feature, but another center would not have, would you know, say, we don't need that, we don't want that. Um, and we had to figure out a way to get consensus and make sure everyone was on the page, on the same page and understand where everyone was coming from. Um, so, uh, and that became especially difficult when, when the pace of the project uh, picked up um, and every team was, was specifically focused on what they needed to do uh, in preparation for the launch. <coughs> so I don't really have any words of advice, uh, and Michael, you feel free to chime in here, about this, but it's something that I think everyone has to go through. And I think, um, you know, if you follow Agile methodology, I think communication is super important. Um, documentation less so, but documentation definitely comes important towards, you know, middle and end. Um, but communication is, is key. Um, and making sure uh, you, you're, you're providing enough context around that communication. Uh, so challenge number two is dealing with cruft. Um, or ROT, um, and for those who aren't familiar with ROT, it's redundant, outdated, trivial content um, and technical debt that accumulated over more than a decade at FDA.gov. So this is 1996. Uh, as we mentioned before, FDA is comprised of several centers uh, with regulatory oversight over certain product areas, and 23 years ago, uh, each center had their own static HTML site, which they maintained manually and updated using FT, FTP, is that what it's called, FTP? Um, and this is a fluid table, by the way, so they were ahead of the responsive game. Um, in 1999, they added more colors, more images, maybe this was an, I think this was a, all of it was an image map. In 2000, uh, they added more content, more links, there was beginnings of a, a, some sort of design consistency um, in 2001, they added a right sidebar column and more links. Text becomes more dense. In 2003, everyone starts to um, unite under a, a common design. But at, still at this point, everyone's still maintaining their own content separately through separate infrastructures. It's not until 2008 when FDA.gov is under a unified web content management system. Um, but Still, set, workflows are separate. Every center has their own web team. Everyone's contributing content separately. There's really, besides um, the precursor to our team, there, there wasn't anyone sort of guiding or providing you know, some sort of global direction. But also, during this process, this migration from, from static HTML pages to a content management system, there wasn't a, a way to, to automate that migration process. So, uh, web contributors spent long, long hours uh, migrating things manually, just copying and pasting from HTML into unstructured content WYSIWYGs. Um, 
And at the time, before launch, they had this sort of really robust metadata strategy. But because of the manual nature of migration, they ended up dropping a lot of the metadata requirements because it was just taking too long to migrate tens of thousands of pages into a content management system by hand. Um, and that's when folks, because of the limited structure of the pages and the templates, folks and the lack of restrictions on the, on the WYSIWYG, people were just going to town with inline CSS. And in 2011, FDA.gov uh, got a, a redesign, a refresh redesign. Uh, we, the team started paying really much better attention to user data and feedback. Um, and we started promoting social media channels, but the unstructured content, um, the lack of metadata, uh, rampant inline CSS, and even like these templates right here in 2011, because we were supporting uh, like really old browsers, like I think at the time this was going on, the agency was on IE5.5. Um, so like all of this was done in a really redundant like HTML, CSS way, like lots of sprites and each corner was an individual, um, you know, a GIF or PNG. In 2013, uh, this is a couple years after I joined my current team, um, I oversaw the responsive retrofit of FDA.gov. Um, our site had started receiving more and more mobile traffic. At this point in 2013, it was about 12% mobile. Um, so based on HHS and White House um, digital strategy at the time, everyone needed to uh, make the move to, to responsive uh, websites. And so we started with a limited set of content. Uh, I developed uh, the templates in about 60 days for the whole site. Um, and it was kind of just, we just needed to get done. But the things that we carried forth through the previous refresh and from the beginnings of the content management system just made things super difficult. Um, because of all the inline CSS um, and the rampant custom code, it, it was hard to find a, a universal solution to convert our site to a responsive uh, site. Um, yes? What CMS were you using at the time? It was a proprietary CMS. Um, so, uh, it, you know, the other challenge of this particular retrofit is that we couldn't change any of the design or IA. It was just purely visual, just to provide an optimal uh, experience on mobile devices. Plus, um, on top of that, our CMS was nearing its end of life. <laughs> so this was our biggest hurdle. Um, and this, <laughs> like, this, this was, everyone was doing this. Tables within tables, it was, it was, yeah, people know. Do you want to speak about this? So, <laughs> thanks, yeah, come on. Um, this, uh, since I was the only person at the time responsible for the responsive design, um, and really at the time the only front end designer, at, and its best front end developer at the time, I'm not even a developer, I was just making things up. Um, so I, I created a, a mobile content guide to help educate people uh, about how they should approach their content from a mobile friendly perspective and how to make best use of their responsive templates that they now had available. Do you have anything to add? No. Like, well, this, the thing is, this is really hard to scale and it's not easy. Like, you have to maintain a PDF. You know, that's not, it, it's, it was limited. And plus, we had you know all sorts of challenges with with the legacy code. Um, part of this was also in order to sort of meet that really strict time constraint of like two months. And this was in the middle of like a shutdown too. Um, <laughs> uh, we uh, we I, I sort of made the executive decision to <laughs> to use Bootstrap. Um, it was uh, a, an easy framework. Everyone was doing inline, you know, custom inline styles. So no one had a common framework to work with. So Bootstrap was, at the time, the most 508 compliant uh, front end framework. Um, so it was just like, let's use that so that everyone can use the same kind of code base um, and use the same layout tooling within the WYSIWYG. So if you're gonna like do crazy stuff in the WYSIWYG, at least everyone's on the same page rather than inventing their own inline style sheets. Um, which, though convenient at the time, it ended up biting me in the butt and him uh, yeah. later. I mean, I think it was a good step at the time, and, and let's 
be honest about Bootstrap at the time. Uh, everyone was doing it. Not you know, uh, boots, it was kind of before the anti-bootstrap movement. Um, so it was just a very you know easy way to roll it out. Um, additionally, it had you know great documentation, uh, which is one of the things um, that you know previously FDA did not have. Um, so you know I think often and to some level to the bad, many of the users quickly figured out that we were using Bootstrap and started to roll out a lot of that WYSIWYG kind of functionality using, um, you know, a lot of uh, custom code. So uh, there was only so much we could do, uh, right? Only so much polish to add years of cruft and rot and uh, a CM CMS nearing its uh, end of life meant that there was like not much we could do to truly improve the system for not only our internal users, but also our external users, um, or to address long-standing issues. Um, also, like, consider how much the web has changed in, in the last 10 years alone. Um, you, you know, the web has become much more than sites and pages, right? We have social media platforms, and podcasts, and blogs, and um, native apps, and uh, web apps and all sorts of things and you know voice assistance like all of that is powered through the web and our platform just wasn't meant for that that type of web so it was time to, to find something else um, so this is challenge three new look same taste so as the migration project started to pick up momentum uh, FDA decided to rebrand um, so in 2016, the classic FDA logo uh, was retired after 30 years of, of great service. Um, and um, just to point out, the, the, the classic logo, FDA classic, was, uh, was hand-drawn by Zeb Rogerson. He was uh, an FDA employee uh, for many years, and he retired a few years ago. Um, but he doesn't get nearly enough credit for, for guiding the, the visual direction of the agency or its identity. So I just wanted to give him a shout-out. Um, so in 2016, the uh, new FDA, what we call it, was, was implemented. In a few ways, the new identity system wasn't really well suited uh, for web and interactive design. Um, I mean, I, I copied, those are two EPSs that are embedded in this keynote, and like the new FDA is just kind of fuzzy. Don't know, don't know why, they're both EPSs, there's just, mm. um, uh, typography and color contrast uh, were both areas that needed to be addressed before implementing. Um, uh, in particular, like, you know, uh, with FDA Classic, Helvetica was the, the spec font uh, used for headers and copy. It's, you know, it's a web safe font. Everyone has it. It's good for performance and readability, but it's boring. Eh, FDA is kind of boring. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, new FDA. Um, Spect uh, FAF DIN, which is a display font, if anyone knows typography. DIN is a font developed um, by the Germans for their, their uh, signage and navigational waypoints. So it's like really meant to be used like on huge highway autobahn type signs. But that's what they spec. It's very industrial looking. Um, and they also spec Georgia as, as, as the font used for copy text. Um, However, after evaluating the licensing costs of FDA, <laughs> FFDIN, uh, we were quickly tasked, Michael in particular, was quickly tasked to find an alternative. Um, so the spec was font, then we're like, no, you can't use it. Find something else. So uh, we uh, found Roboto Condense, which was the closest free alternative to DIN. Um, and uh, we kept Georgia, because that was what was spec'd in, in our guidelines. Uh, it's a, you know, Georgia's a web safe, Serif font uh, for two. However, you know, for two decades, uh, sans serif had been used on FDA.gov. Um, so it was a bit of a shock for FDA web contributors when they saw Georgia applied to their content for the first time, and uh, that's probably diplomatic. It, like people were like, ah. Uh, um, especially since we also increased the default desktop font size from 14 pixels to 18 pixels for, to improve readability. Um, so not only was it much bigger. It was serif font, and people were like, this is ugly. So anyways, challenge four, uh, we fight for the users. Um, so FDA's website serves a variety of audiences, including industry, consumers, health professionals, patients, scientists, and researchers. Um, but over the years, um, FDA has collected uh, anonymized user data and feedback through standards uh, services like Google Analytics but also scroll maps and heat maps and other uh, customer surveys, 
um, you know, group interviews, small workshops, um, and other, other uh, you know, uh, methods. Um, so the pain points you see listed on this slide uh, were common to all audiences. Uh, you know, uh, primarily there's like text was super dense still. Um, navigation was complex. There were just too many links and, you know, uh, there was so much rot, content rot on the site. We had over 120,000 content items at one point um, that it was making search, like, not great. Like, if you try to Google something, there was just so much stuff and so much outdated stuff, no one knew what to go to as the canonical content item. Um, uh, plus, you know, FDA users had their own own gripes with, with the system. They were feeling the effects of the rot. Um, and unstructured content made, like, developing new features and, and automation and dynamic content challenging. And, you know, we still had an issue of, uh, you know, mix of responsive and non-responsive content. And there was just, you know, fragmented design. We still had legacy design, we had bootstrap, and we still had people doing some custom stuff. Um, so the issue of too much text, too many links, uh, was longstanding. And for years, users were, seemed to be overwhelmed uh, by the number of links on the page, uh, where those links were located, um, their context, appropriateness. And when we s started to really consider the issue, we found that um, the previous design on the left uh, placed an emphasis on, on navigational links rather than content. When we really started like taking a look at what each block of text was on a site, we, we just found like everything in red was a link somewhere. Um, and very little green stuff was actual like content that was refreshed regularly. Um, and in the past, it seemed that FDA's attempt at addressing the issue of like really complex navigation um, and deeply buried content was to try to surface multiple links and offer as many navigational choices as possible. Um, but user behavior and, and feedback, you know, indicated that that was really not a good approach to take, right? You know, I, I love this quote because it, I think it's really true, and that's why like you, you have the value menu at McDonald's, like. Or, or even Burger King. You can have Burger King your way, but there's still a set of 10 items that you can just go to. Um, so uh, taking a look at all the user data, taking a look at all the code, um, user needs, uh, all the content rod, we decided to, to renew our focus um, and get everyone at FDA to, to sort of really think about solving problems, um, addressing user needs. Uh, and between 2016 and 2018, the center web teams did a phenomenal job about of reducing the amount of rot and the size of our site by 75%. It was it was monumental. Um, so uh, they that that was probably one of the single most important factors uh, in our migration was just like getting rid of all that rot. Um, and with the help of a dedicated plucky team of contractors, uh, we developed a content model. Um, so we actually had structured content for the first time. We had. 12, we have 12 primary content models and or content types and four supporting content types. Um, and we started to consider design patterns and components that would meet uh, user needs and improve uh, usability. Um, but we also knew that whatever we did, our site would be really complex. It's inherently so, the site and our content. And, you know, we have a mix of consumer content, we have a mix of industry content, but all of it is, can be complex and, and challenging. So we wanted to ask ourselves in if, as an opportunity to redesign uh, with the migration, what could we do to help manage that complexity through design? Um, it's a tall order, but I think having these questions, these three questions that you see on the screen in mind, helped us, along with the data, helped us come to certain approaches. And then this is also something we kept in mind too, because in the beginning of the project, we were super stoked like excited, everyone is. But then, you know, once you take a look at the data and the, you know, the, the situation on the ground, you start not necessarily settling, but prioritizing. Like, what do you really need for launch? And then you also have to keep in mind what users need, too. Um, so, in working with our dev team in the very beginning, um, and with our, with our uh, stakeholders, we, we try to keep these principles in mind that um, the design and the system that we developed would be accessible to all and be task-oriented and uh, evolution over revolution, that it would fail gracefully if it failed, and that we would define measurable goals 
um, and use data to inform decisions and reflect and adjust and iterate and that whatever system that we developed perform well. Yes, and, and I mean this also just yeah, oftentimes allowed us to you know, make those tough decisions about you know, what we prioritize in our builds um, with regard to, you know, if it's something with regard to, you know, it being accessible, uh, not just, you know, from a, uh, you know, 508 or, or uh, WCAG 2 uh, perspective, but also from any device, um, people would be able to easily navigate the site and it wouldn't uh, create issues. And trying to prioritize, even within these principles, how we apply them to what we build um, as we're doing it. I'm talk about this. Sure. So um, one of the things that uh, we did early on in the project is, um, you know, obviously we aim to constantly involve uh, stakeholders. So um, with this, uh, we were trying to figure out at the time, you know, what should we be building? Um, trying to get a better understanding of some of the things that were on the site, um, as well as, um, you know, the reasoning for it. Um, because obviously a lot of the times the content stakeholders are a lot closer to the user um, in many instances than we are. Yeah, so in all of our years at working at FDA, we, we've never seen this comment um, from a user. Uh, like, and aesthetics and design, like look and feel is like really easy to wrap your mind around. Um, working on design, it's, it's, um, it's fun because there's a, like a tangible, uh, an immediate result, right? Like it's satisfying. Um, but it was important for us in, in these sessions with, with our internal stakeholders uh, and customers to have them really focus less on how something look, would ultimately look um, and focus more on like addressing problems and, uh, and, and figuring out, uh, you know, does, does the user needs and assumptions that they have or know match with the data and things that we were observing? Um, and, and Michael took everyone through, and he's a developer, and he, he really did an awesome job with these UX sessions. He's awesome. Um, he just like sent them through uh, various tasks. Yeah, I mean, basically what we aimed to do was, first, you know, we had them navigate, you know, the types of content, the types of things that, uh, in this specific session, it was about a lot of the uh, subtopic and topic pages, trying to figure out what worked for them. So, you know, first highlighting, you know, what pieces of content were there, then guiding them through trying to figure out uh, kind of what user need they were trying to meet with each piece of content and trying to group them all into kind of a common theme. Um, and then at the end of it, uh, they uh, composed kind of uh, very basic wireframes um, that really just allowed us to have uh, a lot better insight into how they prioritized all of those user stories visually um, so that it would help us inform how we built out those topic pages and what functionality um, and, um, was important. Um, so like I said, we really wanted our session participants to focus on, on content and, and how content or tasks should be prioritized. Um, because without, without content, there really can't be an effective design. Um, so we found that every center, like through these exercises and taking a look at all the data, we, had, we found that every center had audiences, you know, with their own set of needs and priorities. And that makes sense, right? Because every, every center has their own product area that they oversee and, you know, uh, you know their own industry customers, their own, their own types of doctors that they, they work with. Um, but, you know, despite, you know, regardless of all that, like general patterns started emerging that uh, aligned with our understanding of user behavior um, and also Coincidentally, aligned with the needs that the our you know internal FDA web contributors were expressing, um, so things like flexible positioning and being able to prioritize content on the fly, um, and offering uh, context for content was important. So this is a, a comparison, bef you know, rough. Like these aren't really really wireframes, but just to show the comparison between um, how dense the old design was in terms of navigational links and how we were planning to approach design and content and, and navigation on the, on the new uh, site. Um, and so we have, in our IA, we have three different levels. We have our main landing pages, which are what we call topic pages. 
Um, those correspond roughly to like foods and drugs and medical devices. Um, and within those topics, like a, let's say drugs, we have subtopics, uh, which may be something more specific, like over-the-counter um, or generic drugs or what have you, or you know, drug safety communications. Um, and then an actual content item, like an article, is the lowest level of content. Um, so this is something that we, we wanted to stress to everyone that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about the bells and whistles. Um, it's about serving people's needs. I mean, that's our job in government is to serve the public. Um, so it was really important for, for us um, to make sure that was the case. Even if everyone wasn't happy, just as long as they were served, that was important. Um, and so we launched, 2019. So um, along the way, um, as we got started with the project, uh, obviously, like many teams, we had multiple developers working um, across uh, individual functionality and pieces, um, you know, myself included. And one of the things that we quickly found out was that even, you know, within that first, you know, month or so, we were already starting to create a lot of inconsistencies um, in how stuff was built, um, either through, you know, redundant CSS or... Um, at what point I counted that beyond what uh, Bootstrap was bringing in, we had, uh, I think, 17 different shades of almost similar blue uh, brought in. Um, um, so we were trying to deal with a lot of those situations um, on the development front uh, to try and streamline things. And that's where um, Lab Coat came in. Um, at the time when we created Lab Coat, um, I was uh, inspired name-wise uh, after Pantsuit, which was uh, the style or design system that was built out by Mina Markham for uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign. Um, and obviously, given the agency's rich scientific history, uh, we wanted to kind of honor that in the name of the system. So the first kind of decision point uh, we came along, uh, and it was a very difficult one because it was a project actually that we were early contributors uh, two, and we're hoping to roll out. Um, but what we quickly found was one, kind of the legacy that was brought, a code that was brought in from Bootstrap uh, combined with uh, what uh, the web design standards at the time, now web design system. Uh, basically, we were just adding a lot of weight to the system that we couldn't afford. Uh, we ended up having to overwrite or just you know, pull little pieces of components and it just ended up adding both bloat to the system um, and um, once again also at the same time having the inconsistency uh, brought about from our change of brand where we were, you know, basically having to change, you know, typography and spacing and it just became very complicated very quickly. Um, we're still hopeful that we will kind of as an agency go back in that direction um, but at the time it just didn't make sense uh, for our project. So as I mentioned, once again, um, kind of both, you know, one of the, the uh, banes of our existence was uh, the pervasiveness by which uh, Bootstrap was inside of content. Um, I mean, it did its job very well, don't get me wrong. Um, but um, at the end, anytime, you know, you're ha having to overwrite CSS, you're just adding more and more weight to the system. We just had so much customization that um, it quickly became a challenge. Um, so we had to look at, you know, what kind of makes an effective, uh, or what makes an, an, a design system effective. Um, and basically it's because, you know, one, it allows us to focus. Um, it basically, um, you know, allows uh, developers and, you know, to focus on what they're building as opposed to what their building looks like, rather than worrying about which one of the 17 blues uh, they should be using um, for the, um, you know, mass head, they, it's already declared, um, which allows, once again, uh, avoiding that distraction. Um, consistency, once again, you know, 17 blues. Um, you know, it allows a, for a familiar, not, not even just from a development perspective, but for our users, when, you know, a button looks five different ways um, across the site, it quickly creates confusion uh, for the users. Efficiency, once again, allowing developers to build things a lot faster. They're worried less, you know, about how a component looks and more so about kind of construction, how some of these components pull together, um, allowing them to focus on the problem. 
Right. They, they, they shouldn't be, you know, thinking about making that 18th blue, you know. They should just reference that one variable and yeah. uh, keep going. Yeah. So one of the first things that we did uh, for the project um, was we, um, using Brad, I think Brad Frost suggested this, was basically uh, create an inventory of all of the custom components across the site. Uh, so we basically went very low tech, sent out a PowerPoint slide where we outlined all of the variation, all of the possible components that we were loosely aware that were on the site, and sent it out to all of the, disperse it to the centers and to um, our uh, partners in IIB to kind of help us identify some of those issues. Um, this was just the example page, so there were a lot more buttons than than what this outlines. Uh, but you could see just in my cursory quick review, there were already a ton of different. Um, you know, appearances for buttons just for performing many of the same actions. So within that, um, with, uh, within uh, LabCo, one of the things that we had to kind of deal with was once again, we had all of these different um, libraries and, and, you know, Drupal itself um, that we're trying to build around, um, as well as also trying to take some of that user feedback of things that we know that they've built into the system um, and trying our best to honor them um, and help, you know, make their job easier by helping it transition gracefully. Um, so we structured it um, basically where one, we, you know, we have uh, within our SAS file, we basically have a bootstrap area where it's just raw bootstrap, um, all of the, you know, the files that, it's a curated list of uh, the components and styling that we're using. Um, we have bootstrap override, which basically is anytime we had to provide style overrides for bootstrap, we would put it in there. Um, we would keep lab code and all of its central components separately, um, as well as its uh, core styling. And then, you know, anytime we brought in like a JavaScript library um, or a Drupal plugin that kind of had its own custom style that we had to create custom solutions for, uh, we would put them in a override file uh, or override directory that directly applied to that module or plugin or, or library. Um, and then uh, we also had a legacy, which kind of contained uh, some of the initial CSS that was written during that first spurt that we didn't quite have time to deal with, um, but also some of that Drupal-specific, um, you know, um, just IDs and, and classes that uh, it was just much easier to apply them there. Um, the nice thing about structuring it this way is that we could quickly go in and, you know, let's just say, you know, a month down the road we decide, okay, we're finally at a point where we can get rid of Bootstrap. Um, you know, our, our content owners have been resting way too much, um, and they need some work. <laughs> so uh, let's get rid of that. No, but um, you know, we could easily just pull out those directories. Everything would compile. We could rely, you know, switch over to the um, you know lab coder if we decided on something else, um, and it would be a lot of easier to separate out what we were working on. Um, to you know, just kind of make a clean as clean a break as we can. So within lab code itself, there basically uh, is core, which contains all base styling on elements, typography, um, spacing. Um, you know, a lot of utilities, uh, variables, and functions. Uh, so we could take all of those seventeen blues, con you know, condense them down to the ones that were coming in from our style guide. Um, and be able to apply those uh, reliably. And once again, we don't have that guesswork about uh, you know, which blue we should be using. Um, and then we have components, uh, which uh, contains all of the components that have been built under lab code, which includes you know, anything from main navigation section, breadcrumbs, cards, um, all of those that we could dedicate resources to. And a lot of this stuff was mainly things that we knew that on the global level, we could easily control the source. Um, a lot of the things that we left over from Bootstrap were those that we knew that users had in the system. So we knew that by keeping that component, uh, you know, in play on uh, within Bootstrap, we would allow them to, you know, focus on what they needed to to, to just mainly get content over and not worry about, you know, reapplying IDs and classes and whatnot. So 
Um, in order to kind of prevent any kind of uh, conf or to minimize the chance of conflicts, uh, basically all components within um, lab coat receive a LCDS um, prefix, uh, which once again allows um, us to just make sure that any library we're bringing in, the, the likelihood that them using a similar prefix um, is fairly low, uh, which allows us to, um, you know, once again, prevent the, the likelihood of override. And that's one of our co-developers, and he's late. <laughs> um, and then we, um, for, for naming conventions, we um, used uh, basic BEM conventions. Uh, so hyphen, hyphen for uh, reserve for um, any kind of modifier. Um, so, you know, we have our base card. Um, and then we could have, uh, as you'll see soon, like a, a teaser, which is a modifier of that base card that has specific styling. Um, and then we use uh, the underscore, underscore uh, to basically denote any child components. So if we have within each card, they can have a title, um, text, um, you know, footer, uh, all pieces of that larger component. So as I mentioned, one of the key uh, um, components was uh, the card. Um, and this is one of the main variations of card. Um, this is uh, the teaser card, uh, which basically its intent was basically to be that very uh, I guess like byte level um, piece, uh, co piece of content, um, many times serving as almost like a secondary navigation in many instances where the user needed minimal information in order to make a decision about whether they wanted to go uh, on to see content. So in this case, obviously, it was used to identify you know, the main areas of product that we re regulate uh, to allow users to quickly be able to make that decision. Then we had, this one's promoted, right? I always get confused about, uh, on, because in, the exam, in one of our examples, we, had, we renamed it about midway. Um, once again, this is more so when it's, you know, we have a little bit more content uh, with regard to pointing to a specific initiative. Um, it allows users, uh, once again, uh, to have a little bit more uh, content w uh, or information to make their decision by. And I don't know if you have any additions to that. No, uh, I think uh, what um, we did with building in lab code was that there was still flexibility within cards too. So like everything was at its base level, there were individual components like standardized image sizes, like all images should be this. And ha making that prior to lab code, everyone was uploading different size images. So it was difficult to find common like visual like design presentations for these images because everything was like cropped at like weird pixel sizes. So standardized standardizing that helped. Plus having the structured content and metadata would also, in the future, it's not um, present now, but in the future to make these, you know, uh, these blocks um, and cards uh, dynamic in nature. So we're referencing like a, a, an image, um, you know, that, that's metadata. We're referencing the title or short title of, of that content item. We're referencing a description or short description for that content item. And we can pull this in dynamically or, you know, uh, as, as it is now for the migration, a lot of it was just manually, manually created or uh, manually editable. So folks had the freedom to just enter what they needed to enter for launch. So also, uh, and this is uh, kind of a, a base card, uh, which um, is, you know, in this case is being used uh, for content that tends to be he uh, text heavy. Um, but uh, you'll also notice that organizationally, uh, cards are actually contained inside of a larger component called a deck. Um, so within uh, this deck, you know, uh, each deck can have a title, uh, can have text, uh, which generally is used for, you know, just to provide a little bit more context uh, to the cards below. Um, and then we have like additional modifiers for if um, you know, the, the content is supposed to be displayed vertically or, or horizontally. Um, but once again, allowing us to kind of org dynamically organize a lot of these cards um, within a larger component was helpful. And then we had what is pretty a fairly standard uh, component across uh, most sites, which is our call to action. Um, it was once again giving users uh, or our stakeholders 
the ability to you know create a little bit more uh, compelling or, or sorry visually compelling um, call to action uh, for a piece of content or initiative uh, that they were running. Um, yeah, something more than like a promoted or popular content block or teaser. You know, like they, they sort of start to to scale up in 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 visual prominence. So, um, and then with this, we're looking at uh, another component within our system was the section navigation. Um, you'll notice that when we first actually built out the uh, section nav in LabGo, it was actually mainly that top um, collapsible um, navigation. Uh, but what we quickly realized in uh, user testing was that people were jumping right past the navigation. Uh, so we added the uh, the left column navigation right. about uh, you know shortly after uh, testing that. Yeah, so that was like a lesson in in not relying too much on what you see in Google Analytics. So like Google Analytics, like when we started looking at user behavior and navigation flow, it was like not pe many people are navigating. You know, so like one one page, maybe two at the max, um, and that was for you know seventy four percent of our users. But then we, when we actually started observing users trying to use the wireframes there and when we couldn't get when we sort of didn't allow them to access search then we knew we had a navigation issue there um, so uh, we made sure that there was a, a, a left nav um, on desktop so uh, the the last component that we'll discuss is the uh, feature component uh, which this um, is as kind of the name implies, was you know if the agency had you know or agency or one of the centers had one piece of compelling content that they wanted to feature above any other, um, this would allow them to present that information. Um, so many of these components, this one not included, when we first built them, we kind of had the idea of driving most of it dynamically. Uh, but what we realized pretty quickly as well as we were kind of experimenting with it. We wanted to allow the users to have a lot more ability to kind of curate what the design of their topic page or the FDA homepage would look like, um, or even their subtopic pages would look like, and allow them, you know, that functionality that drove them to uh, build a lot of bootstrap components initially. Um, so without, upon that, we uh, stumbled upon, uh, like many use, uh, paragraphs. Um, so we built out our, our dev team, the royal we, um, um, basically took a lot of the, and this is a, one of those other areas where having the components in, in um, lab code allowed it to be a lot more easier, or a lot easier to point uh, or to port this over to paragraphs because we already had class conventions, um, you know, dealing with, you know, cards stacking next to each other. All of that was already built into the CSS. All they had to do was you know apply paragraphs to that um, you know CSS or layout paradigm, um, which made it a lot easier. Does everyone know what paragraphs is? A lot of knots. Okay, good. All right. Uh, the other thing we wanted to do uh, was you know for for a lot of functionality um, you know accordions um, within content or um, you know some basic buttons and and some some other basic functionality that tends to appear more so in main content. We wanted to give the users the ability to, um, once again, you know, easily be able to embed that functionality without having to write HTML. Um, because one, you know, that makes it a lot more difficult for our system to you know, persist and, and trying to avoid kind of the problems we ran into with that first uh, project of having a lot of HTML and then you have to deal with legacy along the way. But it also gave them a lot of power and didn't require um, you know the the uh, the the, uh, the style guide that we that had been previously handed out um, to remember what class name because you know we would receive obviously constant emails about you know what class name or people would use the inspector and figure out you know how we comp how things were composed um, but this uh, short codes you know which basically uh, who's familiar with short codes <coughs> all right you guys must be the developers. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, but basically, it, rather than writing out the HTML, it allows you to kind of provide very, loo a very not loosely structured, but a, a lot more compact uh, listing of what that content looks like, um, you know, and 
it kind of builds out and, and applies the HTML in build um, rather than having them have to know HTML, JavaScript, CSS, or, or you know, whatever. Did you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think it was, you know, short codes is a great way to, to abstract what would traditionally be written in like inline HTML and CSS. Like you can, with this module, you can, um, you know, create your own custom basic tags, which have their own kind of syntax. Like you see here at the bottom, like some examples like quote and image. And that allows them, like if you do that, it basically replaces it in the back end with like HTML for that thing you want. So if you said, like we have one for accordion, if people just wrap their paragraph in that tag, it turns it into a classable panel on the front end. Yeah, excited, right? <laughs> yeah. So this was a way to help us like avoid, again, WYSIWYG content rod, inline, rampant inline CSS, HTML. We want everyone to, use, as much as possible, use short codes. And we're still in the beginning of building this feature out in, in our editor, um, but it's, it's been pretty handy. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and you know, like especially like I said, as we move more toward lab code and away from, from Bootstrap, you know, some of it allows us to abstract once again that 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 CSS, so that if you know we make the change of let's just say a you know a Bootstrap button to a lab code button, we don't have to say, hey, can you change your styles because we're going to remove the style sheet across <coughs> the entire site. We now can do that in one place, and all of their short codes work, all, you know, as soon as they. Um, yeah, you know, without having further changes. So, kind of in, in going back, um, once again, uh, you know, some of the, the challenges that we faced, uh, as I, as Nick mentioned, uh, you know, typography acquisition, um, you know, and not just even from the monetary perspective, um, and when we realize why we can't have nice things, um, but. Um, yeah, also, once again, the, the color contrast requirements. Uh, one of the things that we ran into, as Nick mentioned, with the style guide is that you know, some of the, the branding wasn't fully tested across um, to how it applied uh, to uh, you know, uh, you know, um, screens. accessibility. Yeah, yeah, and screens. So uh, we had to deal with a lot of testing and figuring out you know, how do we make this work as best we can uh, when do we have to advocate for, you know, hopefully some changes within the, the system um, and just to make that easier. Um, core dependencies, once again, or sorry, code dependencies, um, you know, Drupal markup, uh, we've had, you know, several components where we've had to go back and just because, you know, a specific module was used, the markup didn't, uh, wasn't necessarily as clean as we would have liked it to be. So we've had to provide, once again, those overrides um, where we can. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, once again, external libraries, uh, Bootstrap, uh, you know, uh, we've had a JavaScript library. Yes, yeah, a lot of, uh, yeah. And the, one of the things that I kind of jumped over was that we used, um, I think, what was it, three or four, three or different, four different table different. sorting? Yeah, um, in the previous design. So, you know, and, and that was something that was, uh, you know, kind of fixed along the way. Uh, a lot of the Thanks to a lot of the centers that stepped up and 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 uh, were able to help us support some of that stuff. Uh, some of it was just taken care of as well through that move from what was being used to develop dynamic tables to moving over to views. So, um, kind of, what does the future have for us at this point, and and kind of what what is driving us at this point, or what are what am I going to be working on tonight since I took off today? Um, once again, just continuing to refine lab coat. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, we're still relying on some bootstrap components, trying to um, you know, build some new ones, um, port some, some away from, uh, a little bit more away from bootstrap. Um, we want to give our users more power, uh, so we want to enhance paragraphs. Um, you know, what, whether making an existing paragraph uh, better um, or adding new ones uh, that better meet their needs. Um, custom short codes. Uh, there's still, I think, a lot you know we could we're, that we're working on to try and improve, uh, especially the short codes that apply to some of the lab coat uh, components uh, to make it easier for for users. Uh, we want to also finish out our style our style guide uh, so that we have that central source of documentation. Um, for lab coat that makes it easier for all stakeholders um, 
to and you know developers um, as well as content providers to be able to reference and figure out how things are working. And then also, um, you know, we're hoping uh, to. Uh, we worked a l very hard, and, and as our uh, as everyone on on the project uh, to streamline a, a lot of the content types and, and metadata requirements. So we would like to kind of flex the muscle that um, we've uh, been building in the winter and, uh, you know, show uh, some limited public APIs so that we can help, you know, the community uh, yeah. who leverage a lot of our services um, and, and uh, you know, even extend to, to new devices and new products via API. And then I don't know if you want to... Um, so in the end, uh, all the sweat and, and tears paid off, and uh, offering some obligatory uh, platitudes, um, we felt it was appropriate. But uh, thank you. Um, we, sorry we ran over time. If you have questions, we'll be out there like. <laughs> so thanks.